Hi, my name is Jeff Penn, and I teach philosophy at Northern Illinois University. In this video, I'm going to talk with you about contextualism in epistemology. Earlier in our series, Jennifer Nagel explained the problem of skepticism. Here's a recap of one kind of argument for radical skepticism, derived from a famous passage by Rene Descartes. Do you know whether you're awake right now? That seems like a pretty easy thing to know. In most settings, you probably wouldn't hesitate to answer yes. The answer is so obvious, in fact, that it's a bit strange even to ask the question. At any given moment in ordinary waking life, most of us would be quite confident that yes, in fact, we do know that we are awake. If you can know anything at all about yourself and the world around you, it seems like you can know this. But now consider the possibility that you're currently dreaming. If you were having a vivid dream, it would seem to you just like you were wide awake, watching and listening to a video about epistemology. But in fact, you would be asleep in bed. Ask yourself, do you know that that's not what's happening right now? Many people find themselves inclined to say, well, no, I don't really know that. After all, how could you tell? Vivid dreams can be indistinguishable from waking life. Yet if you're dreaming, you're not awake. So if you don't know whether you're having a vivid dream right now, how can you know whether you're awake right now? We seem to have a very simple and powerful argument that, in fact, and contrary to what you might have said at first, you don't know that you're awake right now. And if you don't know th that you're awake, it seems unlikely that you know anything at all about the world around you. Philosophers have made many attempts to respond to this kind of argument on behalf of our common sense judgment that we can, at least frequently, tell whether we're awake. These attempts are philosophically interesting, and some are quite sophisticated. But none of them has gained wide acceptance. It turns out to be really hard to prove that you're not having a vivid dream. Contextualism provides a different way of responding to this kind of skeptical argument. It starts with the observation that many of the words we use in everyday life refer to different things in different contexts. Consider, for example, the word now. If you say, it's sunny now, at noon, when there's not a cloud in the sky, your claim is true. If you say, it's not sunny now, at midnight, when the sky is pitch black, that claim is also true. But wait, how can both of these claims be true? One says it is sunny, the other says it's not sunny. The answer is obvious. The word now refers to different times in each sentence. Whenever it's uttered, the word now refers to the time at which it's uttered. That's because the word now is context-sensitive. Well, what if the word no is like this, too? This is precisely what contextualists claim. They say that what the word no means depends in part on the context in which you say it. In some contexts, it would be true to say that you know something, while in other contexts, it would be true to say that you don't know that very same thing. And that's because, contextualists say, the word no means something different in each context. Different contextualists have different ideas about how this works. Gail Stein, an early and influential contextualist, thought that when you say that someone knows something, you're saying that they can rule out the relevant alternatives to it. For example, suppose you're watching a movie with your friend. She hasn't heard a peep from you for a while and asks whether you're awake. In that context, the only relevant alternative to your being awake is your having just dozed off on the couch. Your friend's not worrying about whether you're having a vivid dream indistinguishable from waking life. Things are quite different when you're arguing with a skeptic, though. In that context, the possibility that you're having a vivid dream is a relevant alternative to your being awake. In fact, that weird possibility is the main focus of the conversation. So according to Stein, the fact that you can't rule out the possibility that you're having a vivid dream does undermine your claim to know that you're awake, but only in contexts where that possibility is relevant. In a skeptical context, you're forced to say that you don't know that you're awake because the dream possibility is relevant, and you can't rule it out. But, and here's the crucial thing, in an ordinary context, when the dream possibility is not relevant, you can still claim to know that you're awake, and claim it truly. The skeptic can make that possibility relevant by bringing it up and forcing you to talk about it. But that doesn't mean it is relevant in ordinary contexts when you're just talking with regular people 
and not arguing with an irritating philosophical skeptic. Contextualists aren't trying to prove that skeptics are wrong. In fact, contextualists agree that in some contexts, it's true to say that we don't know even that we're awake. But this isn't because of some deep fact about what we can or can't know. It's just because that's how the word know works. When we cede control of the conversation to the skeptic's whimsical imagination, his argument succeeds. But we don't have to do that, and ordinarily we don't. The skeptic treats an unusual feature of the conversational context that they themselves create as if it were a general fact about knowledge itself. But once we see how the word no works, we can see that the skeptic poses no threat to our ordinary knowledge claims. Now, properly speaking, contextualism is a claim about language, and in particular about the word no, and not about knowledge itself. So contextualists argue for their view not by making epistemological claims, but primarily by making careful observations about how we use the word no in ordinary life. Stuart Cohen, for example, considers a case like this. Suppose that you're flying from Los Angeles to New York. Looking at your travel itinerary, you see that it says that your flight stops in Chicago. In many typical airport circumstances, that would be enough to make you comfortable claiming to know that your flight stops in Chicago. After all, it says so right there on the itinerary. But now suppose that someone has an urgent meeting in Chicago, and it's really, really important that she makes it there. If she doesn't land in Chicago, her job is at stake. She sees your itinerary, but she knows that itineraries are, every now and then, sometimes wrong. For example, the flight schedule may have changed at the last minute. Given how important the stop in Chicago is for her, it would be quite natural for her to say that you don't actually know that the flight stops there. In order to know, from her perspective, and given her practical circumstances, you'd have to check with the agent at the gate. Contextualists treat the fact that we ordinarily use the word no differently in different contexts as strong evidence that the word no actually means different things in different contexts. Some epistemologists say that since contextualism is a claim about language, it's irrelevant to the debate about skepticism. That's a debate about what we can know, and not about how the word no works. But if contextualists are right, there is no general, univocal question about what we can or can't know. Rather, there are only questions about whether we can accurately describe ourselves as knowing in different conversational contexts. This observation takes most of the bite out of the skeptic's argument. As Keith DeRose, a leading contextualist, puts it, once I start to get a clear look at what it would take to know according to the skeptic's absolute standards, I find the distress caused by my failure to meet those standards to be minimal at best, perhaps to be compared with the distress produced by the realization that I'm not omnipotent. Knowing by ordinary standards, relative to ordinary alternatives, is enough for ordinary purposes. The skeptic is right that we don't know by his own hyperinflated standards, but according to the contextualist, to base the case for skepticism on this observation is to fall victim to a trick of language.